Hi, in honor of National Library Week, we, the library staff of Splendor ISD, are doing a different theme each day, and today's theme is Tall Tale Tuesday. So, today I'm going to share a tale with you from South Carolina called The Talking Mule. A farmer owned a mule, which he used for work all week. But being a church-going man, he let the mule rest on Sunday. One Sunday, the farmer had to go to a funeral, so he sent his son to saddle the mule. Since when do I work on Sundays? asked the mule. The boy dropped the saddle and ran to the house. Pa, the mule talked, he shouted. Can't you even saddle the mule? asked the farmer. But Pa, the mule don't want to work on Sunday, the boy protested. The farmer sent the boy to his room for talking crazy and went out to saddle the mule. Move over, he said to the mule. Where's my supper? asked the mule. The farmer dropped the saddle in the same spot as the boy and ran out of the barn, followed by the dog. I ain't never heard a mule talk before, he gasped. Me neither, said the dog. The man bolted for the house and slammed the door. The mule talked, he told his wife. What? said his wife. And when I exclaimed, I ain't never heard a mule talk like that before, the dog said, me neither. That's crazy, said the wife. What's so crazy about that? asked the cat. Haven't you ever heard a mule talk before? The end. I would like to wish all my library staff a very happy Library Workers Appreciation Day. And thank you for everything that you do. And it's Michael always a pleasure Wallace to work runs with you. the mail. It's, great. it's a Texas folk tale retold by Essie Slosher. Bigfoot Wallace, that wild and wacky Texas ranger, returned to the wilds of frontier life once the United States had won the war with Mexico. And it suited him nothing else like nothing else could. Soon he was freighting mail 600 miles from San Antonio to El Paso, and it was the wildest stretch in the Wild West. Wallace was the only man who could do it. Anyone else who tried to do it was scared off by attacking Comanche and Apache warriors or killed outright. It took a month of hard riding to make the trip, which ran right through the old Comanche Trail. Indians and soldiers all knew him as a reckless, fearless man. Any warrior who wounded or killed Captain Wallachie was sure of a hero's welcome in his tribe. But none ever succeeded, though there were times that Wallace would ride into an army outpost with his mail coach so shut up that he had to lie over for a few days to repair it. When he wasn't running the mail, Bigfoot was, was still worked for the Texas Rangers, taming the untamable and keeping the peace. It took him over 20 years of busting desperados and dodging Indians before he decided to retire. Wallace lived out the rest of his days in the company of his good friends, the Brumelette family, and an old, as an old man who lived with her daughter Fran and her husband Don Cochran, telling tales of his frontier exploits and outwitting the antics of Fran's very active boys. Bigfoot Wallace died in 1899, and his final resting place was at the State Cemetery in Austin. But the stories of, of its exploits live on to this day, and somewhere on the road to El Paso, the spirit of El Morato still lives. Thank you. Hey y'all, today I'm going to read to you a tall tale. Um, it's Johnny Appleseed by Patricia DeMuth. And yes, I do have a cooking pot on my head because Johnny Appleseed wore his like this. All right, so I'm going to start. It is Johnny Appleseed by Patricia DeMuth. And I'm reading a, a book from the Open Library Archives, which are free books that anyone can enjoy. Who was Johnny Appleseed? Was he just in stories? No. Johnny was a real person. His name was John Chapman. He planted apple trees, lots and lots of them. So people called him Johnny Appleseed. Johnny was young when our country was young. Back then, many people were moving west. There were no towns, no schools, not even many houses. And there were no apple trees, none at all. Johnny was going west, too. He wanted to plant apple trees. He wanted to make the west a nicer place to live. So Johnny got a big, big bag, and he filled it with apple seeds. Then he set out. 
Johnny walked for days and weeks, on and on. Soon his clothes were rags, his feet were bare, and what kind of hat did he wear? A cooking pot. That way he didn't have to carry it. Snow came. Did Johnny stop? No. He made snowshoes. Then he walked some more. Spring came. Johnny was out west now. He stopped by a river. He dug a hole. Inside he put an apple seed. Then he covered it with dirt. Some day an apple tree would stand here. Johnny set out again. He had lots more seeds to plant. Johnny walked by himself, but he was not alone. The animals were his friends. Most people were afraid of wild animals. They had guns to shoot them, but not Johnny. One day a big black bear saw Johnny go by. It did not hurt Johnny. Maybe the bear knew Johnny was a friend. The Indians were Johnny's friends too. They showed him how to find good food, berries and plants and roots. Where did Johnny sleep? Under the stars. Johnny liked to lie on his back and look up. The wind blew softly. Owls hooted. The stars winked down at him. Many years passed. Johnny planted apple trees everywhere. People started to call him Johnny Appleseed. One day, he came back to where he had planted the first seed. It was a big tree now. A girl was swinging in it. That night, Johnny stayed with the girl's family. He told stories. Everybody liked Johnny. Stay with us, they said. Make a home here. But Johnny did not stay. I have work to do, he said. I am happy. The whole world is my home. More and more people came out west. Johnny planted more and more trees. In the spring, the trees bloomed with white flowers. In the fall, there were apples. Round, red, ripe apples. People made apple pies and apple butter for their bread, and apple cider to drink, and children had apple trees to climb. It was all thanks to Johnny Appleseed. Hi, Splendora readers. Yeah. I thought I would read to you a fractured fairy tale, which is kind of like a fable, and it's called, Honestly, Red Riding Hood Was Rotten, and it's the story of Little Red Riding Hood as told by the wolf. So, chomp, chomp. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just finishing my lunch. My name's Wolf, Big Bad Wolf. You may have heard the story of the Little Red Riding Hood about a girl and her granny. Seems everyone here has, but my tale is different. And I say tale, I mean tale. Once upon a time, I ran out of food, completely. The cupboards were bare, the freezer too, and I'd eaten every last vegetable and fruit in the garden, every one. Other wolves might, other wolves might have lunch lunched on our little forest critters, chickmucks, bunnies, squirrels, but I'm a vegetarian. That's right, I don't eat meat. Well, I try not to eat meat. I love apples, honey crisp, pink lady, golden delicious, any kind, really. But sadly, it was a long time until apple harvest time. I hadn't eaten in weeks and my stomach growled and howled. It moaned and groaned, it even roared, and then my nose took over. I took a whiff, what was it? A girl, sniff, sniff. I took a whiff. What was it? Cake, butter. In this forest, I had to investigate. And there she was, Little Red Riding Hood. She looked as plump and juicy as a big sweet apple. Little Red waved her cake. Isn't it pretty, she said. Yes, I said. Aren't I pretty, she asked. Was she admitting herself, admiring herself in that petal? With this cape, I'm even prettier than usual, she said. Boy, someone was full of herself. My stomach growled. Little Red twirled a strand of hair. Mother says the cape looks grand with my skin. My skin shines like pearls. Or the meat of a ripe apple, I thought, licking my chops. Remember, I hadn't eaten in weeks. Time to chomp. But then Little Red said, I can't wait until Granny sees how pretty I am today. I'm bringing her cake and butter for my mother. My stomach held two meals. I thought Granny for breakfast, Little Red for lunch, and cake and butter for dessert. Where does Granny live, I asked. Little Red pointed. 
down there in the clearing, the brown house. I knew that house and I had a plan. Let's play a game, I said. Little Red smiled, I am awesome at games. I bet you are, I said. You take this path and I'll take that path and let's see who arrives at Granny's first. I will, she said. I am the prettiest and the fastest. I bet you are, he, I said. My stomach moaned. Before it groaned, I ran. No one knows the forest like I do. I do. I chose the shorter path. Sniff, sniff. I took a whiff. What was it? Apple air freshener? Tap, tap. I knocked on the door. Who's there? Called a voice. Your granddaughter, I squeaked. I brought you a cake and butter from mother. Doors open, Granny said. Granny tugged at her nightcap. Green, she said, isn't it pretty? Pretty like a Granny Smith apple, I thought. Aren't I pretty, Granny said. You must have heard the say saying the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Well, it's true. My stomach roared. What's that noise, Granny asked. Chomp, chomp. I had to eat her. She was no Macintosh apple, but not too bad. I still felt hungry. Tap, tap. Little Red knocked on the door. Who's there? I called out, crawling into Granny's bed. Your granddaughter, Little Red said. I've brought you cake and butter from Mother. Doors open, I said. Little Red walked in and caught a glimpse of herself in the mirror. Isn't my cake pretty, Granny, she said. Aren't I pretty? I clenched my teeth. Granny, Little Red said. What deep, dark eyes I have. Hmm, I said, the color of apple seeds. Granny, she said, what perfect ears I have. Hmm, I said, shaped like sharply cut apple slices. <laughs> Granny, she said, what pretty red lips I have. Hmm, I said, red delicious. Granny, she said, what lovely skin I have. Chomp, chomp. I ate her up. What can I say? Things look different when you're hungry. She was no Fuji or, Fuji or crisp and apple. In fact, to be honest, she was a bit rotten. But she was better than nothing. Plus, I got dessert. The end. So that is the story of the Little Red Riding Hood as told by the wolf. Hi, it's Miss Joyce here from Peach Creek. I'm here to tell you a tall tale. A tall tale is a folk tale with an unbelievable, exaggerated story told as if it were true and meant to be humorous. I don't know how many of you uh, enjoy them. I love them. I think they're great. I'm going to tell you Pecos Bill Rides a Tornado. It's a Kansas tall tale retold by Essie Schlosser. Now, everyone in the West knows that Pecos Bill could ride anything. No Bronco could throw him. No, sir. In fact, I only heard of Bill getting thrown once in his whole career as a cowboy. Yep, it was that time he was up in Kansas, way up there, and decided to ride him a tornado. Now, Bill wasn't going to ride just any tornado, no ma'am. He waited for the biggest god darn tornado you ever saw. It was turning the sky black and green and roaring so loud it woke up the farmers way over in China. Well, Bill just grabbed that there tornado, pushed it to the ground, and jumped on its back. The tornado whipped and whirled and sidewinded and generally cussed its bad luck all the way down to Texas. Tied the rivers into knots, flattened all the forest so bad they had to rename one place the State Plains. But Bill, he just rode along all calm-like, giving it an occasional jab with his spurs. Finally, that tornado decided it wasn't getting this cowboy off its back know-how. So it headed west to California and just rained itself out. Made so much water, it washed out the Grand Canyon. That tornado was down to practically nothing. When Bill finally fell off, he hit the ground so hard it sank below sea level. Folks call that spot Death Valley. Anyway, that's how rodeo got started. Though most cowboys stick to Broncos these days. Hope y'all enjoyed.
Have a great day. Hey everybody, it's Mrs. Kroger, and I have a tale for you today. A tall tale, because it's Tall Tale Tuesday. And the tall tale I want to share with you today is about a famous guy named Paul Bunyan. Now, Paul Bunyan was a larger-than-life kind of guy, and he also had a companion named Babe the Blue Ox, which was just as big. But today we're going to tell you the story about the birth of Paul Bunyan. So here we go. Now, I hear tells that Paul Bunyan was born in Manger, Maine. It took five giant storks to deliver Paul to his parents. His first bed was a lumber wagon pulled by a team of horses. His father had to drive the wagon up to the top of Maine and back down whenever he wanted Paul to fall asleep. Now, as a newborn, Paul Bunyan could holler so loud, ooh, he scared all the fish out of the rivers and streams. All the local frogs started wearing earmuffs so they wouldn't go deaf when Paul had a temper tantrum and screamed for his breakfast. His parents had to milk two dozen cows every morning and night to keep his milk bottle full. And his mother had to feed him 10 barrels of porridge every two hours to keep his stomach from rumbling and knocking down the house. Within a week of his birth, Paul Bunyan couldn't fit into his father's clothes. And after three weeks up from his birth, Paul rolled around so much during his nap that he destroyed four square miles of prime tenderland. His parents were at their wits end. They decided to build him a raft and floated him down off the coast of Maine. Whenever Paul turned over, he would cause 75-foot tidal waves in the Bay of Fundy. They had to send the British Navy over to Maine just to wake Paul up from his nap. The sailors fired every cannon they had in the fleet for seven hours straight before Paul woke up from his nap. Whew! And when he stepped off that rat, Paul accidentally sank four warships and had to scramble around scooping up sailors out of the water whew, before they drowned. After the incident, Paul decided that East was just too plumb small for him. And the family moved to Minnesota. The end.